Namaskar. Today, I would like to focus on what I consider to be the most crucial aspect of integral education, the teacher. Because if there is no shift in the teacher's consciousness, everything becomes mechanical, artificial, imposition. So the factor that is of utmost importance is the teacher's own growth, deepening, widening. In my previous session also, I touched upon it. The film that you saw, New Education for a New India, also emphasized it. And I'm sure the sessions you've had yesterday and will be having today will also focus around it. But often what happens, we get lost in the externalities. Even if we focus on teacher and teacher education, we get lost in the externalities, learning skills, conceptual knowledge, teaching methods, etc. I would like to create a space and time today to look at some of the guidance from the mother to the teachers. What does it mean to be an integral teacher? I'll share my screen. The first thing, to love to learn. The mother says, this is the most precious gift that one can make to a child, to a student, to a learner, to learn always and everywhere. Now, normally we create a division between studies and enjoyment, free time, pleasure. It is as if whatever we like to do has to be done in our free time which automatically means that whatever we are doing in school in the name of studies is something we do not enjoy and do not love. Now this division has to go. Learning has to be enjoyable. It is something that I must learn. And obviously then as a teacher, I must love to teach. It must be a joy for me to go into the classroom and to share, to evoke, to help each student under my care progress. Not just a job. So love to learn. Think about it. How are you going to create this condition in yourself and in the students? So joy is essential. The mother says, true education must reveal what is already present in the developing beings and make it blossom. So something that is already present in us, that psychic presence, that dedication of the vital to a higher purpose, dedication of the mind, at the core, it is already present. Now this must be brought forth. Just as flowers blossom in the sun, children blossom in joy. All of us do. If there is joy, when we feel happy, there is a different glow on our faces. There is an expansion of the being, a lightness of being. Now this joy is essential to learning and to progress. So love of learning and the joy in learning. And what is the aim? like I referred to it yesterday also, and the multimedia too, progress is the aim, not success. Success will come. That's a consequence. When I do something with complete joy, dedication, concentration, success is bound to come. At least 
perfection in my effort. Whatever is left to chance and to so many other factors of life, that is different. For that, a different force is needed. But whatever is in my hands directly, progress is the aim. Mother says, what you should do is to teach the children to take interest in what they're doing. And that is not the same as interesting the students. In the name of child-friendly education, we often make the mistake of entertaining the child. There is no harm in being entertained. But being entertained is not the same as being engaged, absorbed, immersed. So if we want the child to learn, the student to progress, then everything should be made interesting, meaning the child should learn to take interest in what the child or the student is doing. Even if it is something they have not chosen. And that depends on the desire for knowledge, for progress, that aspiration to know, that curiosity which little children have naturally, which we often kill by discouraging questions, by asking them to toe the line rather than inquire. Little children do not make distinct distinction between play and learning. That happens later. We as adults bring that in. So to take interest in everything, the mother says, even like sweeping a room, if you do it with concentration, it becomes quite an experience, a meditative experience. Try it, try it for yourself. So progress being the aim, not finishing the task, writing that paper, getting marks, all that are very secondary, very small aims, which will anyway get fulfilled if one is focused on the larger aim. The students are our mirrors. The mother says, I have always thought that something in the teacher's character was responsible for the indiscipline of the students. Now, normally we think if we make things too interesting for the children. There is freedom, there is joy, there'll be noise and there will be indiscipline. Yes, there might be noise, but happy noise, noise of learning, not noise of destruction. If there is indiscipline, the mother is pointing out that it is because my center, my stillness is not in its place. I am not disciplined. When I am not disciplined, my environment too will not be disciplined. And children pick that up, my inner vibration, and they reflect it. So whatever difficulties I face in my work from the students, and I tend to project it on them and say, the students are like this, they do not concentrate, they are destructive, they are aggressive, the mother's advice is to see it as a mirror and to see how I am responsible for those vibrations emanating from me. Am I emanating peace, stillness, calmness, self-control? Or am I emanating distraction, unhappiness? dissipation. So this becomes a point where it becomes very interesting because then as a teacher, each and every moment I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm as much of a learner or maybe more so as the student. Self-control is the key. So further to what I just said, the mother speaks about that you can only control the children psychologically when you can control your own nature. If you are not in control of your own nature, whatever comes to your mind, you say it, you are angry, upset, you behave in a certain way, later you regret it. All of us do that, no. 
So if that happens, how can I expect to control anybody else? If I'm not master of myself, Swarat, how can I expect to be master of anything around me, Samrat? So self-control is the key. And obviously, the attitude has to change. We spend so much time planning our lessons, organizing, teaching, learning resources. It is important, no doubt. But what is most important is the attitude. Do we plan? Do we visualize? Do we aspire, pray for, imagine? What is the attitude we will take tomorrow in our classroom? What is the inner atmosphere we will operate from? What is the outer atmosphere we will create through our vibrations? Do we visualize that? Do we give it power? Do we imagine it vividly to make it a reality the next day? That is the time we must spend. When we plan our lessons, plan also the learning environment, not as infrastructure or in terms of materials. That is very simple to do. And after years of teaching, that is, you don't even perhaps do it anymore. But the inner environment, your poise of consciousness, that is what is most important. Spend time praying for it, aspiring for it, visualizing it, imagining it. Just like in Olympics, the athletes do. They imagine, they visualize themselves running the race in a particular way and doing their best. And that has an impact on their performance. So the world is catching up on these inner means. Where are the teachers? To be an example. Example is a much more powerful teacher than direct teaching. The mother says, don't demand from a child something that you yourself cannot do. Calm, equanimity, order, method, absence of useless words, all these ought to be constantly practiced if you want to instill it in your students. So this is as much for parents as for teachers, to be the example of what we want our children to become. If we want our children never to be angry, never to be sad, never to tell lies, we have to set the example. And to be the child's best friend. As teachers, we tend to put ourselves on a pedestal. Even the classroom arrangement generally puts the teacher in a position physically higher up. But to be equal, the children must be happy to go to school happy to learn, and the teacher must be their best friend who gives them the example of the qualities they must acquire. So happiness, ask yourself, are your students happy coming to your class? Do they go out happy, not just because the class is over, that's why they're happy, but because of what they have gained in that interaction, how their soul has blossomed, how their minds have opened up how their being is at ease to create that atmosphere, to create that relationship. The school should be an opportunity for progress for the teacher as well as for the student. How many schools offer this? That they look at the teacher and say, hey, you are also here to learn, not just in terms of skills and all. No, your growth is equally important. Your well-being is important. If you grow as a person, you grow in consciousness, the children will grow, the school will benefit. Investing time and money into it, giving that space. An integral teacher, an integral school must create this space. And there must be freedom to develop freely. The teacher should have the freedom, the students should have the freedom. 
freedom does not mean license and to do whatever I please. Freedom to follow my noblest self. Freedom to grow in harmony with my inner being. Freedom to train my mind to its utmost. Refine my emotional being in the best possible way. Train my physical being perfectly. That freedom and freedom to go within, to come in touch with my deeper inner truth. And if all this seems, God, how will I do it? Now I have to read this book and that book. The mother says, there is nothing, no method, no process, which is bad in itself. So begin in whatever way you know how to begin. Everything depends on the spirit in which it is done. So it's the attitude, it's your intention. That is what is most important. That is what will create a difference. So to be a teacher, the mother says, is to be a yogi. It is a tapasya. It is a tapasya of love. The pursuit of beauty, the pursuit of knowledge, and the pursuit of power, the power over yourself. Beauty in your thoughts, emotions, sensations, in the environment. Physical beauty too matters. How you arrange the classroom, tiny touches, flowers, incense everything in its right place. It automatically creates a kind of silence and ease in the being when things are organized well. Knowledge, wisdom, of course, perfection, doing things in detail. And most important is the inner sincerity. I cannot be perfect today, I mean, but what is important is to know that, to know that I'm also growing. I'm not any way above the children. I need to grow in my consciousness. And integral education is an opportunity for me to grow. And as I grow, I create ripples. As the flower blossoms, it gives out a fragrance and it spreads. And that flower is me surrounded by all these little flowers, the, my students. So that is what integral education and integral teacher is about. I would like to show you today a short film, another one made by the Gnostic Center called L'Avenir. L'Avenir is French for the future. And it takes up the journey a teacher needs to go through, the inner journey. And once I take that up, I can facilitate that the students too go through that journey, if it is their soul's choice. Thank you very much. And I wish you the most beautiful journey ahead with sincerity as your constant companion and the mother's grace to guide you. Namaskar.